Today is July 20th and it's, it's been 53 years since the moment uh, they landed on the moon. And today, by sheer coincidence, we are editing the scene with Neil Armstrong and we thought it's the most amazing thing ever and we really need to uh, have a toast. Cheers! Cheers. Today, uh, we'd like to talk about editing. We filmed with two cameras, we had many, many hours of footage. Yeah. And I think that the two of us, we're not that organized, so we would probably get lost in it. So we hired uh, an editor called Monica. Uh, she's uh, obviously a woman, and Monica. And uh, she basically did all the dirty work. Yeah. She took all the material, all the audio files. She had to organize everything, sync everything. So when the first day we came to the editing, everything was prepared yes, for us. Yes, yes, which was great. Yeah. And of course, the first question was, how do you even start, right? Where do you start editing? First off, you need to set up the characters. You have to see di the dynamic, right? Uh, between those two characters. Mm -hmm. But there are also different takes we filmed on the set. Sure. So some uh, with more energy, some with less energy, yes, some funnier, you know, some more serious. Yeah, some are more uh, r realistic and some are over the top. For instance, for Jack Van Kerr, he's a very comedic character, right? Mm -hmm. And then when you come to the edit, you want to see is he like totally a parody or is he more uh, realism with bursts of comedy? Or, mm -hmm. you know, like mm -hmm. you have to find the voice, I guess, of the character and who he is. This is one aspect of editing, you know, uh, yeah. the emotional side of the yeah. characters. Yeah. And there is another side which is technical. Yeah. So we have uh, different types of shots. We film them together, we film them separately, we film them over the shoulder, stuff like that. The best thing is not to just randomly start throwing shots together, right? So we always try to find the logic in the scene. We talked about it more in the, in Story the storyboarding video, video yeah. as well. There has to be a directing there, plan behind it. Exact, exactly, right? If they start the scene uh, and they're not really friendly, we would keep them separately, each one in their own shot. Then you uh, add a two shot of them being together, but then when the scene comes to climax, then you suddenly change the side, right? You go from, from the profile. Mm -hmm. So there is again this uh, switch of dynamic. Because right. the idea is how to keep it fresh. How to keep it fresh for three minutes. And yeah. it's just two people talking. Yeah, so yeah. yeah. If you have an extreme close up, you would probably save it. For the last. For the last, for the impactful moment. Of you the scene, you right? remember those westerns of Sergio Leone? He was always building up towards the, the ultra close ups. Yeah. This was something he leaves for the finale. Uh, one other thing that we often use is a subtle zoom on, a, on yeah. a character. When you film, you can you can zoom on the lens, but it's more complicated and you have to have a zoom lens and stuff like that. So we mostly use it in the post. We just zoom in the shot a little bit. You can always get 10, 15% of zooming into the picture without the picture losing quality, right? The, the whole point, the philosophy, the philosophy. Uh, is uh, you try to draw the audience into the psychology of the character, yeah. into the story. Yeah. That, that, that's the whole purpose of a slow zoom shot, and I guess. I, for me, it works really well. I, when I see it in other movies as well, when somebody starts talking something, you know, a story, a story or yeah, something, something, and, that and the camera starts, you know, going... Yeah. You know you it's feel, important, right? You and know it sucks important. you in. It sucks yeah. you in, yeah. yeah so it it's always a, works. It's a cool yeah. technique, yeah. yeah. After a while, we edit individual scenes, but at this moment, we don't have any visual effects. There's no yeah. wide shots, no, no landscapes, no nothing. And we also didn't film inserts yet, right? And um, what we would do first, we would uh, use the storyboard pictures, right? If, if, if we drew on a storyboard, a car passing through the road, we would just put this picture in. And this is more for information, for just information. to know what's happening. Yeah. Sometimes if we came up with some shots at, during uh, editing, we would just write a title, you know, something happens, right? Okay, the problem a... with storyboard yeah. pictures and written stuff is you don't yeah. feel the rhythm. There's, yeah, no, of course. Uh, there's no length in yeah. the shot, right? You can put, you can place it for a couple of seconds, but you don't know how it feels. That's why we did uh, a series of uh, experimental shots, just random footage with our smartphone. Yeah. Just to get the right feel and rhythm of the scene. So if, if we, like, for example, we had a car at that point, but, but I didn't build any miniatures around the car, but he would just film the car, you know, in my yard and put it into the edit just to get the timing of the shot, yeah. right? And we knew that the final shot is going to be more or less similar to that yeah. one. And then, like, when we place the inserts, especially into the yeah. shots, like, that helped so much. I mean, we film. had the whole insert episode, e episode and yeah. you know how we feel about inserts. Exactly. They're awesome, and they can elevate your movie to a new level. Yeah, yeah. So, now that the edit is more or less, like, filled with all the shots, right? Everything is there. Now it's the time for trimming. 
Yeah. Trimming, um, it, it is a hurtful process. It's kind of like uh, uh, a surgery. Yeah. But on your own body. And you have to do it by yourself. The, the problem actually about trimming only a few months after shooting is you still re remember how much effort it took, yeah. how many days of shooting, how much money it cost. Mm -hmm. And then what you really need is a cold-blooded surgeon. You definitely do no big trimming. Yeah. You just start slow, right? The slow movements. That, a line here yeah. or there. In the scripting phase, right? We yeah. were just like have, having endless discussions about the dialogue. And still, yeah. when you film it and you come into the edit, you notice, oh my God, he said the same thing twice, basically, in a scene. So you cut one piece of information out. Yeah. This is the first phase, just trimming scenes, right? But now, when you have all those scenes combined into the whole film, now you watch it as a whole, as a unit. Mm -hmm. And then comes the second phase, a heart trimming. So there was a scene where uh, George uh, gets the idea for the urinal net. We showed how we filmed it in one of the episodes. And uh, at the same time, it was the launch of the Apollo rocket that he is not witnessing because he's in the toilet. Everybody's shaking the earthquake scene. And now we realize that in the very next scene after that one, he explains verbally to some other character how he came up with the net. I've been meaning to show you something. I, I uh, finally cracked the splashback problem. Right. And he's, he's actually presenting the and net he's for presenting the, first time. the net yeah. for the first time. You're looking at the urinal splash guard 1.0. The, now the feeling is, uh, you showed it in the scene before, and now you're again talking about talking it, about telling it. it. So you're showing it basically twice. twice. So, hmm, maybe, so, you know, maybe we should cut the whole scene. <laughs> the thing we did, yeah, we took out the whole scene. But the first impulse, what okay. was the first impulse by you? Like, oh, of, of course, it's painful, Ooh. yeah. The, the guys built the sets when we were filming. We also shot a lot of inserts for yeah, that scene exactly. later. Later, right? Yeah. We did the sound, the foley, the <laughs> oh, yeah, shaking. That a was a work. few days of work, a lot yeah. Of work with it. You but, don't maybe want to get rid of it, but uh, for the sake of the whole movie, it's actually better yeah. if you're without it. Yeah, I think that's the most valuable lesson I learned over the years to just like be radical with the edits. You should try to trim everything that comes to your mind yeah. because if it doesn't work, you can just easily bring it There's back. There's always right? a director's cut. Exactly, yeah. And you can put it back in the director's cut. Yeah, yeah exactly, yeah. You, get, you encounter oh, yeah. a, lot of, a lot of problems during editing. Uh, for example, we had a scene with, with Neil Armstrong. He's talking with two guys in one part of the room and in another part of the room, George enters and sees them. And we realized during the editing that we never shot George's POV. We, we, never, we never filmed it on the day, right? So we have a problem, we have a logistical problem in the, in the scene because we need to establish that he sees them. <laughs> of course, you start looking over your footage that you filmed <laughs> and trying to find <clears throat> one second that, that will work. Yeah. And there was this shot. It was the last shot of the day when the bus driver wanted yeah, okay. to leave. It was panic. And we yeah. filmed three takes of a wide shot of this, uh, of this room, right? Yeah. And we realized that maybe we have just one second where the three of them are standing and talking. And if we zoom in just, you know, a little bit, we could we could pass it for, for George's POV shot, right? Yeah. So that's what we did. We cut it in and it kind of worked. We were missing some people around. So I think uh, later we also filmed some you people filmed on green screen. My yeah, parents, yeah, or, you know, whatever, yeah. green screen. And I, I placed some people into the shot to make it more, you know, rich. The whole point is George needs to hear that Jack Van Kerr is saying peanut, right? Uh, in that shot, Jack Van Kerr is turned with his back towards the camera. Mm -hmm. So you never see him open his mouth. So it's the ideal situation to place a new sound. Are you talking about the uh, peanut? That's how you call it? Like after watching the movie, movie for a few times, I forget about it, that we ever changed, that, that yeah, it wasn't yeah. intended that way. <laughs> yes, yeah. When you edit, you're manipulating with images and you're making a story. But it's basically the same with sounds, right? You know, suddenly you breathe new life into your film. You know, sounds are able to do that. They're very important. We just came to the sound studio of our friend Ivan. We have a little box of goodies with us. Uh, you know, some cans, some uh, urinal nets. It's been a few years since we were recording Slice. And uh, it's the same place, same people. Much less enthusiasm this time. <laughs> <laughs> this was a dialogue heavy movie, so obviously we had a sound recordist on set. We recorded all the dialogue, but we wanted to add a lot of sounds of, of, of movement, of clothes, of yeah. stuff like that, yeah, right? Yeah. Which is called Foley. A Foley uh, sometimes can be great for setting up character. For instance, you have a super villain and he's wearing a black jacket and black leather gloves. Mm -hmm. Obviously, this is the sound you want to hear. 
so you make it a bit stick out, right? Because, you know, leather sound is evil. One example from our film is the moment when, when Kerr, uh, he has a little mustache comb yes. and he's like combing his mustache. So it's a vanity moment. It's a vanity moment, yeah. And you want this sound to really... And usually it's very hard to put in the movie because you have music, you have dialogue, right? You have all these layers of sounds and you usually wouldn't, absolutely, you wouldn't hear that. And look how we're supposed to do the shot, but then we figured out that my comp is uh, pretty non... Uh, Hygienic. Hygienic. <laughs> so I'm actually doing it instead of Luca. So. But <laughs> we just put it on purposely on the top, just to stick out, right? Because it's something you you want your audience to notice. Okay, this guy is like totally vain. He has a mustache comb, right? Yeah. Relentless drive and dutiful patriotism bravely lead our nation into a new and exciting future. And there, there, there was even a moment that we thought about recreating, but I think it was not possible. Because Van Kerr, you know, he's one of those drivers who's driving and looking in the rearview mirror and he's pulling hair from his nose. And we wanted to hear that sound, but the problem is you can only hear it in cartoons, in you know, like... <laughs> Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's not realistic to yeah. hear that in real life. Yeah, you know, yeah. we, we, we would love to hear, have that actually in the movie, if it would work. If, if it would work, yeah. yeah but Maybe on the next one. Yeah. There's a scene where everything is shaking in the in the shot and we have these uh, cans. We mentioned this scene of the uh, earthquake when everything is shaking because the rocket is launching. We filmed a bunch of cans. Okay. That's a scene that actually needs a lot of sound, uh, sound effect work, right? Yeah, because you yeah. have to construct everything. You have, you have to have low rumbles of the earth and the high uh, cans hitting and stuff like that. You have all the sounds you can think of and a lot of work went into it yep, <laughs> but the scene went out in the end and of course one of the most important sounds in our film was the zipper and now faster uh medium You know, uh, George is looking at Van Kerr from a distance at NASA. Van Kerr is talking to some journalists, right? And uh, when you just have uh, uh, George looking at Van Kerr in silence, it's nothing. I mean, you can see some little people, but it's nothing. Suddenly you add the whole sound of, of people moving. NASA, you add the sound of a helicopter. Somebody's talking on a huge stereo. <laughs> hey, how we doing? You know, suddenly this sounds scene like becomes real, alive. Yeah, it sounds like a real place. Yeah, they are there. You know, we are looking at miniatures, but the sound makes it feel real. You could do uh, an approach with a typical uh, uh, cinematic score. Just film the whole thing, and okay, add uh, a typical cinema score underneath, and it will work. But you're missing an opportunity, in my and your opinion. Mm -hmm. Because you have a period movie, right? And first thing which comes to mind is obviously rock and roll. Sure. Because, because it's... The late 60s, Beginning of 70s. Yeah, yeah. So this, that would be kind of like a logical way to go with yeah. rock and roll. But our story is not about that. Our story is about corporate uh, company, right? We decided to use jazz. Yeah, but why? I forgot. <laughs> but because it sounded more intelligent, more corporate, more serious somehow. At least I think so. Welcome back. Oh! Yeah. Hello! Uh, the music was done by our friend Tim. Tim from, Zibrat. From Slovenia, who scored Slice of Life as well. We are, we are at Tim's studio, sound studio, where he makes magical music and sound design. We always meet together for a couple of days and we start, you know, just brainstorming. He, he, we, we just try out different stuff, right? As we always say, this is the best part of the process because you just get to lay down and watch somebody else do the work. Don't step into the in front of the camera when I'm speaking. Yeah. Well, I'm just from Tim's left side, so he has pressure from both sides, and that's always important. <laughs> important was that we get together for the first session, where we basically set everything up. Just throwing random ideas, and that's usually the best. That's where you lay the groundwork. Mm. And then later you can do sessions uh, over the internet, whatever. Uh, since Tim is in Slovenia, we're in Croatia, we would do a lot of um, online sessions as well. He would just like share his screen and play, we, we would hear the music that he's making and we would just be able to talk in real time. And this trumpet is stupid right now because it's on its own. That's not very romantic, but you know, sometimes but there is works. no other way. Yeah, so yeah. yeah. It's a beautiful spring day outside. 
and I'm trapped with you. We decided to give certain instruments to certain characters, right? Yeah. So George, he's like a gentle type. He's a tragic character in a way. He's so also a romantic. A romantic, I would say. exactly. Yeah. So we decided that clarinet would be the perfect choice. Because it's nostalgic, it's yeah. old school, it evokes blah, blah, blah. daydreaming. Daydreaming. Yeah, something because like he is a daydreamer, yeah. you know? Yeah. His theme is probably one of my favorite pieces of music from yeah. this film. And Venker, on the other hand, he's a, a lion. He's a wolf, he, wolf by, by Freud, he is the pure id. I mean, he's a sexy man, he has a mustache, he's cool, strong, you know, masculine. So that's why we gave him the saxophone. And you can obviously play the instrument in different ways and get different sounds, but we always pushed him for more this raspy, growly yeah, saxophone, yeah. like, you know. He was our man fatal. <clears throat> man fatal. The, the laboratory supervisor, he's a comedic character, Absolutely. basically. He, he is a moron. And that's so, why he got the trumpet. The tuba. The tuba. The, tuba, the, the, the tuba, stupidest, sorry, stupidest trumpet It sounds have. like a bunch of farts combined. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm always scared that it's too stupid when you put this tuba. So, we have the edit, we have the sound, we have the music, we have everything. And the final thing we need to do with the film is... Mix. Mix. Usually yeah. it's just like you go there to Tim's place, yeah. to the studio, and you definitely say, okay, Tim, today we're going to use the whole day doing the mix. It turns out that Luke and I just sitting there and Tim is somehow fixing music for five, six hours. Yeah. Yes, we waited for seven hours today and then we worked for one hour. Yeah, and then it's, <laughs> yeah. that's it. I mostly updated Windows and then I updated <laughs> Reaper, installed a few new plugins, yeah, stuff like this. Yeah. But it's so important actually because now you have music, you have uh, sounds, you have dialogue and you really want to decide in every moment which sound comes on top because yeah. you're you're basically doing the drama right now, you're creating it with the mix, right? <laughs> Uh, I mean, you, you are literally deciding at that point what the main sound is. Sure. Uh, and that's a creative decision. It's finished. I'm a millionaire. We have no idea what we did. I'm a millionaire. This is the end of the final mix. We have no idea if it's good or not. So I don't know, it's still creative, but I guess... But, but it's very uh, boring to talk about. <clears throat> Yeah, we don't have anything interesting to say about it right now. Yeah, so we can just end the video here. Yeah, Yeah, yeah I, I, I can't wait for AI. I need someone to replace me. But I can still put my name on it, you know? That's, that's what counts. <laughs>